Hello, Guru Nation. Welcome back to the Clinical Trials Guru. This is a long overdue, I mean, <laughs> probably the longest overdue interview. Anna Marquez. Anna, I interviewed you at Skype, um, or Scope, two years ago, and the videographer screwed up. <laughs> and I did like I did like twenty interviews that day and got nothing. This is how many videos I got back from that. I would I would have been better I off with my that phone. Day. Yeah, I remember that day. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. we had a good one too. I feel like we had a really good one. So yeah. you've been incredibly busy traveling the world. I've uh, I follow you on been, Snap, yes. <laughs> Snap, Instagram. For those that don't follow Anna, you should probably follow her there. I'll have links to your LinkedIn. Your Instagram, your Snapchat. We were trying to do Instagram Live, but it wouldn't work. So back to the Skype YouTube formula. Back to uh, the good old ways. Yeah, old-fashioned uh, mm-hmm. Skype. So mm-hmm. Anna Marquez, founder and CEO of Marquez Clinical Site Partners, right? Yep. In Florida. So you guys have an Orlando clinic. Mm-hmm. You have a Miami clinic, right? Yep. Can you give well, us some have, background? Yeah. So essentially, um, uh, Dr. Fakir, who's my partner, we started the first site in Winter Park, which is right outside Orlando, about uh, 15 years ago or so, oh, doing okay. a lot of sleep research, uh, respiratory, uh, now doing CNS, nephrology, different indications. And then... Um, we started opening up other offices and it really happened by accident, kind of. It was other sites coming to us that weren't performing well um, or physicians wanting to do research. And so um, we have the infrastructure. We've been very successful here in, in Winter Park. Um, we've been doing you know, phase one through four. And so we just decided to, you know, start helping sites out. And so we've got about uh, 11 offices. Um, so it's been all sites. organic growth. So you never set yep. out with the idea of, hey, I'm going to expand and, you know, have all these clinics and all these doctors. You just wanted yep. one site. You know, yep. the doctor you introduced me to earlier, uh, yep. he got you started. Yep. Uh, what? Dr. When was this? Yep. When, when was this? Uh, this was uh, Dr. Faki opened up the first research facility in 2003. Wow. 2003. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and at the time, we were doing nothing but sleep research. Um, I didn't know anything about research. I'm an accountant. <laughs> um, and so oh, I didn't that's get your background? involved. Your background yes, uh, finance. Okay. I have a master's in finance. Okay. So um, I was, you know, I really didn't get involved until later, until a few years later. And uh, yeah, so it's been it's been wonderful for everyone. And we've got an amazing team here. So um, our goal is to basically take our expertise, you know, and help other sites. And um, not only that, we've actually had sponsors that have come to us when they've had sites struggling uh, with enrollment or whatnot. And which is all of them. (laughs) Exactly. A good number of them, at least. And so yeah. sometimes they'll come here on site and, you know, we'll give them training, whether it's barometry or we'll, we'll tell them what we are doing um, wow. to be successful with enrollment and share those little tidbits. So Interesting. Now, would you describe your company as an SMO or no? No, I would say we're a network because each of our sites uh, is truly independent, um, you know, completely independent, uh, separate entities. And so they just, some of them uh, we, we own, um, most of them, you know, are owned by the physicians, the PIs. Very and then, similar and then to what we're doing. Wow, that's yeah. a good model. That's a good yeah. model. Yeah, and then I do, um, I, I do negotiate contracts for sites all over the U.S. and Puerto Rico as well. So I've been doing that for, for a number of years now, and I mean, it's, I've done several hundred negotiations now so i've done many 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 more since our last interview yes so. you have that was in 2012 i think yeah so it's been um, about six years yeah and even then you had experience but now it's like even more and now oh, you see the sunshine it's, it's, act and they're trying to yeah. throw all these excuses at you and they oh negotiate. yes 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 yeah it's all nonsense because at mm-hmm. the end of the day nothing has changed other than the tactics and what you need to know 
to say and how to negotiate. And, you know, right. we work with a lot of sites just like you guys do through DSCS. And we have, like, mm-hmm. a startup CRO now. But, mm-hmm. you're I mean, we're amazed now. And in our first interview, you told me most sites don't negotiate. And I didn't believe you. But nope. I, I'm seeing it now. They just take what they're given, which is rule number one, don't do that. Just right. And we just we just took um, we just took a site under our wing. They just came into our network and that same situation, they've signed every single budget as it's come in. And uh, I mean, it's going to be quite an experience now for those CROs because they're going to have to bring up their pricing. Um, and we've been doing auditing for them and um, having to bill thousands and thousands of dollars in work that they've actually been doing and not being compensated for. Um, you know, sometimes the sponsors or the CROs, they change how you enter the data. Yeah. And sites don't realize that, you know, we get paid to do things once. So that's actually one of the things that we've done with them is go back to the sponsor and say, hey, this site has done, you know, a ton of work having to re-enter data that they had already entered the first time. Now you've changed or redesigned how the data is entered, we shouldn't be doing this for free. So they said, sure, send us the hours. And so, you know, that's um, something that we're taking care of. Yeah, I just did a video on remote monitoring because we had a site here in California, uh, in L.A., actually. They're on a remote monitoring study. Mm -hmm. um, And they are required to scan all documents. And they never knew that going in. So now they have... People like this gentleman, Doc, right? <laughs> he's he's out there uploading documents with one of their other coordinators, mm-hmm. and uh, they, you know, these are coordinators. They have other things to do, mm-hmm. yet they're scanning documents. And yep. guess what? They never they never put that in their budget or their contract. Right, right. And that's something that I have a sheet that I send with every request. Every budget negotiation, we send them um, a sheet that has all the invoiceables that we're requesting. And amongst that sheet is, you know, remote monitoring. Um, A lot of times you don't get it, but sometimes you do get it. Um, I mean, I just finalized the contract where we are getting paid um, for that. So excited about that. But, um, you know, I mean, things are just constantly changing and you have to keep up. Yeah. And as you know, most of the time sponsors will tell you no immediately, almost immediately um, on most things. But it's really on your documentation that makes all the difference. It's I often feel like I'm going to court. You know, I have to bring my evidence (laughs) with me. Yeah. You know, and so I have a spreadsheet for how my startup is broken down, how my I got an email today. Hey, you want this much for close out? Could you send me? Uh, your backup, and I already have, you know, a spreadsheet with how many hours it takes to close out, you know, you have to pack the binders, um, the time for the PI, you know, you have to sign off on those final case report forms. I mean, you know, it, it's quite a bit of work. You have to ship documents, um, possibly to storage. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's just, you have to have that documentation. I send it in immediately with my request. With my initial budget counter, I send the overhead policy, which explains to them why my overhead uh, ratio is what it is. So, um, yeah, we've been trying know, to get 40%, and I put an open. I'm you guys probably get better than that. I mean, we have Chris, uh, my business partner, he actually negotiates all the budgets. Now, I used to do this mm-hmm. stuff like yeah. the first time we interviewed, but now I'm doing more yeah. biz dev and just a million things. But Chris does the budgets. Uh, he does like 10 a day now. It's crazy. He yeah. does a lot of budgets. Yes. Uh, he says if you can justify it, uh, they'll accept it. And our overhead is right. like 40%. Anyone who wants overhead policy wording, just oh. email me and I'll copy and paste it yeah. to you. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I've, I've read literature on overhead and it, it seems to be um, all over the place. And it obviously also depends on the type of institution like universities, universities hospitals. Um, I mean, they can have an overhead rate of 70%. But when I look at a budget, and a lot of times, they won't even put in any overhead. And, you know, you'll get these budgets with, here's the, here's the total for visit one, 1,500. Here's the total for visit two. And, you know, you ask them, what, what overhead did you build into this budget? Because you don't even know what overhead they built in. 
Um, and sometimes you'll get a budget and they put in a 10% overhead. And I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, really, I mean, who has a 10% overhead? I mean, who yeah. even has a 20% overhead? You know what I mean? It's just, um, I think we just are not very good business people. We don't know our numbers, but really you can take a look at your profit and loss for last year and see what your, what your overhead is. You can find the answer there. Yeah. The way I took mine and anyone out there welcome to do this, but, uh, I didn't even know what that was. Well, I started back in 05 uh, full time and then I became an owner in 06. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I quickly learned all these things and I just looked at local universities near me. What is their overhead policy? Because they're all publicly funded. They have. Oh, the yes. So yes. I just took them all, combined them mm-hmm. and said, here, and I've never had anyone push back. I never get, I don't always get 40% of what I ask, mm-hmm. but I mm-hmm. always get something. And right, they've never had a right. problem with my policy. So it's right. not that difficult to put right. together. But if you're going to be in this long term, you should uh, put together one for your right. institution. Because you right. may have costs right. that other sites don't have. Well, right. And, um, and for example, you're out in California. In California, we know cost of living is higher. You know, areas like Miami, New York. Um, so if you know that you're in an area where your cost of living is higher, you know, use that to your advantage as a site. Um but what I've learned over the years is, you know, it's it's a give and take. Negotiating is a give and take. And sometimes they'll say, well, maybe I'll give you a higher um, uh, cost per line item, but maybe leave the overhead at whatever. Say, for example, 30 percent. And maybe the site is asking for more. So mm-hmm. it's about compromise. You know, sometimes there are. Sometimes you get everything you want. Very rarely you do, but it, it does happen occasionally. There's been times where I've gotten everything I absolutely wanted. And I tell you that was, I felt that like that day, I felt like I won the lotto, you know? Um, <laughs> um, so and it's you have just to be, one, you have to be a good site to get everything you want too. That's, yes. That's one thing people probably, you know, are, you need to understand that Anna has been doing this since 2003. Uh, she's built a reputation as having a good site. So you can get more of what you ask for in your budgets. Uh, other sites are just starting out. You can't. All the right. Time. It, yeah, you can. You can. So historical performance helps you. Um, the other thing is when you're negotiating for a network, it's also you, you do have more bargaining power. You really do because you yeah. are negotiating for a number of sites. So that helps you. Um, Interesting. So you know, you, that, that, that does, does help this. you. Chris does this too. So when you negotiate for, let's say, I don't know, like a dozen sites or let's say half a dozen. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you do it all at once, or do you go one yes, by one? Yes, we we nego- no we negotiate uh, a pricing negotiated for all sites across the board. Same pricing, same language for all sites, but obviously each site has their own contract. Okay. So, but we essentially negotiate the template, um, and then everybody gets everybody benefits from mm-hmm. that pricing. Now, one thing that sites need to be aware about there is um, the way the industry is moving is they're moving to uh, towards networks versus going to the independent sites. And I've already started to see really? that with some of the major CROs where they're going directly to the networks with projects. They don't want to have to deal with the one-on-one sites. And obviously wow. it depends on the trial. How difficult is it, you know, to enroll? Um, because as you know, if, if they're doing a trial, it's very hard to find patients for They'll, they'll even be willing to give you the trial, you know, even if the site's never done trials in that indication. Yeah. So it, it, it all varies, but um, that is definitely the trend. And I mean, you can go to any industry conference and you're going to hear that. So networks are gaining strength. Interesting. You so. and I are well positioned for this because we, and, and we do that. Interesting. Cause, deep, and now deep. it's cyclical, right? Like It is. That is the case now. That's the trend now because... I think for the next seven years, we're going to have a surplus of studies. And so, of course, they want networks. But when that cycle reverses, right. I think the opposite is true because then they don't right. want to sign networks. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's kind of like, you know, they went through a period where, you know, SMOs were big then. Oh, SMOs, not good. You know, bad reputation. <laughs> bad now SMO. it's like, right, bad. SMO. And now, now that's like coming back again, you know, where because they're finding that, hey, SMOs, networks. You know, they can give us uh, the patients faster. You know, they, they, they know their sites. Like, we know our sites. Yeah. You know, we know we know who does well and what and, you know, who's who's strong and what. So CROs, there's a lot of advantages. C- 
CROs are the new SMOs. Um, I've been told by five different people this year that are like high ops, uh, key opinion leaders at these conferences, and they said CROs, the big ones, are yes. the new SMOs. I asked mm-hmm. why, and they said... And they're getting quality. into it. I mean, look at quintiles. Yeah, quality. It's all quality. Or now IQVIA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or whatever so. they're called now. I mean, mm-hmm. they're going to lose market share over time, and all these boutique CROs, sponsors are bringing all this stuff back in-house, mm-hmm. and all these mm-hmm. boutique CROs like mine... By the way, anyone that wants to start a CRO, I don't recommend it. I recommend a site. Uh, <laughs> much more profitable, much more profitable, Anna. But for what we're trying to do, it makes sense to do the CRO. But if yeah. you just want to build a business in this industry, go for the research site, not the CRO. Much more, much greater profit margins. Um, but yeah, the CROs are, the big CROs are having the same quality control issues that the SMOs had in the 90s. So yeah, I mean, full cycle. yeah, it just comes and goes, right? Everything's in waves, but I think it's important for us to be educated and, um, you know, you got to move along with the times. Of course, you have to so, adapt. You got to move along with you, the times. You guys it's are like, smart. I mean, we were, I was talking to, to a site this morning. Um, and I mean, years ago when we started doing research, we were doing a lot of advertising in the newspaper, local newspapers. But I mean, even that is changing, you know, and you're having to constantly figure out, well, what works for my market? You know, what, what's my population? I mean, so you have to constantly, you know, have to move with, I mean, there's so much, so much going on now, you know, exactly. You have to adapt. Look at how everything is tracked. You know, you go on Google, I mean, these people track everything. They know what you, what you're looking for, what your age range is. I mean, they use all those stats to, mm-hmm. You know, I may be looking at something for COPD. Next thing I know, I'm being targeted, you know, by COPD you know, or getting COPD ads or, you know, even CROs will, will come up, come at me. So it's, it's somebody's world. buying all that data, you know, a different yeah. world we live in. Um, I read an article that said we could all use a little lithium. Uh, it's actually it's a funny <laughs> title. So I bought some lithium on Amazon. And now when I went on Instagram, this was today, I went on Instagram and I'm seeing what I bought as an ad <laughs> sent to me on Instagram. So right. that's how you're being tracked and right. sites are being, being tracked, tracked too. Everything we look at online is being tracked and somebody's buying that data. Mm-hmm. So, and, and a research site owner might be watching this right now and saying, why are they talking about this? The reason we are is because you, my friend, are being tracked. Everything you do. How quickly do you enroll? How quickly do you screen yes. after your SIV? Mm-hmm. How quickly do you answer queries? All that stuff's being tracked, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you better be doing things the right way. Um, you know, they're looking at metrics. If you can imagine it, they're measuring it. Yeah. Well, not only that, but they're using that information as well for advertising. This is what your marketing companies, you know, this is how they know so much information. They're tracking that information. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when you got started, so you were in accounting before. Mm -hmm. And then uh, your current PI. My current PI. Yeah, Dr. Faki. He's Dr. Faki. Dr. Faki wants to say hello really quick. (laughs) How are you doing? doing? Thank Uh, you for introducing the research uh, world world. to (laughs) Anne. Yeah. So. Anyway, a lot. So, so in 2003, in 2003, I'll take. Yeah. So in 2003, Doctor Faki. Yeah. yeah. Doctor Faki introduced you, got you into research. Research. Doctor Faki introduced me to research. Yeah. Um, I was his practice administrator at the time. Ah. Uh, um, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, but he um, always involved me on the financial aspect. And initially, I was just um, helping him put together, you know, financial statements and, and things of that nature. And pretty quickly, I mean, I had to, I had to get involved. I mean, I was always involved with the HR and um, issues like that. Um, but uh, yeah, and then a few years later, I, I you know, uh, he asked me to take over and. Uh, you know, had to learn everything uh, that I know now, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. So, but uh, you never seen you never seen anybody that learns so quickly and take over 
take control <laughs> of the situation. <laughs> no, I know. I, I know. met I Anna, met Anna at once and, uh, and uh, interviewed, interviewed her. Interviewed her. Follow her, follow her on social, social media. media. She knows she knows, stuff, she knows what she's doing. doing. Even, even you're even you're involved, even involved with, with the SCRS, SCRS right? right? SCRS, yeah, I've been involved with SCRS, um, uh, been on se several advisory boards, um, also with ACRP, um, MAGI, um, you know, just all the different uh, uh, organizations, DIA that are out there. Um, I'm, I, I believe in collaborating. I think it's really important. Um, every problem that you have, somebody else has already had. So I know when I got started on in this business, I didn't have anyone to help me. And so whenever I see someone that is struggling, it's just in my nature to want to help. So there's a lot of great information out there. But I think the one thing where you've been incredibly helpful in, well, I mean, you, you've been helpful in so many areas because you, I mean, you have, your library is so massive um, and you cover so many topics. But the budgets and contracts is always just something that we can never get enough information on. And no matter, e even if you've been doing this for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, um, I still go to conferences and you can learn from people. You yep. know, you may yep. think, well, I've been doing this for 15 years. I've learned everything there is to learn. No, there's somebody else out there that is asking for something that is is has never occurred to you to ask. For example, um, one of the newer ones that I just learned about is cancellation fees. Um, sites are now trying to get paid when a sponsor cancels a trial because, I mean, you know, there is work. Um, now, I've never personally gone after it. Um, uh, fortunately, we don't we don't um, have too much of that where trials um, are canceled. But um, although, funny enough, we just had one this week. They're but um, going to be more prominent. Be more prominent right. And so that's something new um, that I had not seen. Um, so like I said, I think you have to be open. Um, there's people out there that know much more than you do. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from one another and it just benefits everyone, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, we're going to have, we're gonna have to have both of you guys, of you guys speak, speak at, at the conference, conference when we, when we, when we do it when next, we do year, next year, 2019, mm -hmm. uh, the Clinical yeah. Child yeah. Guru Conference. Um, uh, now yeah. biz dev, very important for sites, right? business development tremendously important that's probably one of the most important things i say and you brought you brought in your son david right i follow him too <laughs> yeah they, so david runs a site in miami okay. um like i said we have different sites so he runs so he's a director for clinical trials of florida down in miami um and he's he's done a really good job um you know with that site so yeah he works with me and um dr vicky also has several family members yeah. We've had good experiences overall um, working with our family and not always easy. Uh, make no mistake, we've both had our challenges, but uh, overall it's been good. Yeah, it's been good. I mean, Dr. Fakie's son is a PI now um, for us. And years ago when we were just getting started, he was a coordinator. And so now he's wow. working with his PI. So that's been very rewarding for Dr. Fakie. Mm -hmm. Look for look at you guys. I mean, that's awesome. So who do, who does your biz dev? Is that you, Anna? So the BD, I do the BD, and then also we subscribe. You know, there's different things that you can subscribe to, and yeah, then also yeah. we pay we pay companies as well. Um, okay. For I mean, you know, there's a number of companies out there. Um, yes, there are. I'm one. I'm one of them. Yeah, and basically, you know, if somebody brings a trial to us, I mean, and we're not we don't know about it. I mean, definitely, we're happy to. You know, I don't think you should um, you, you should be closing too many avenues on that. There are companies that I tell you I don't prefer to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't prefer to work with companies that take an entire percentage of the contract or, you, you no. know what I mean? I, I just I just don't. I do that as a last resort. But that's, I got burned. I got burned yeah. early yeah. in the days. Uh, basically, all the services I've built is uh, scratching my own itch. So biz dev. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. I was looking for people back in 05, 06, because I was doing the coordinating. I didn't mm -hmm. have time to biz dev, and I know it's an ongoing thing you got to keep yes. doing. You I do. Was, I was asking consultants to do that for me, begging them, and they wouldn't do it. They were like, no, no, I only do QA. I don't want, I know you need studies, but I don't do that. 
you know, right. but I charge 3000 a month. And I said, well, okay, but I'll pay you that if you can also give me studies because I know you have sure. contacts. Sure. And they couldn't do it. So I said, you know, we're going to build that service ourselves. We're going to mm-hmm. do it. We've been adding sites like crazy. Uh, but it's a constant thing. Even in a busy year like this year, it, this is the busiest year that researchers are going to have ever seen on record. Um, but if you're a new site, you're not going to get those studies unless you know how to biz dev. No, no, no. But one of the things that we do as a network that I think has been incredibly beneficial for our investigators is we train them. And so um, they'll come in here and sometimes they start out as our sub investigators. And so they get that initial um, experience. And that's also good for us because we can gauge how involved they're going to be. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's important that you work with an investigator who's involved. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're the CRO, you're the sponsor, if you're a network and you want, you know, you're going to bring on a site. Um, we take a lot of pride in our work. <clears throat> and you don't want to work with an investigator that, that has no time to mm-hmm. run that site Because that's just, you're just looking for trouble. So, now, a lot of sites watching, they may be looking for physicians to add to their network. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to do that uh, in your experience? Well, I think um, definitely like Dr. Faki is, I think he's, he's the master at that. I mean, you um, know, I've been here for 30 something years. So I know a lot of doctors and a lot of people and uh, I know who would be a good PI and who would not be. mm -hmm. So really you have to have a personal relation to start with. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah, that's important you mentioned that you know who, because if you ask a doctor, nine out of 10 will say that they want to do research, but only people like us who know what it takes will be able to know, oh, this guy's not going to do it, or she won't be able to do it. So that's that's important when nine out of 10 are going to think that they want to do it, and then you know it's very unlikely that this person's going to follow through with uh, being a PI. Well, one of the ways that you can tell very quickly if the investigator is going to be good, um, you know, for us, for example, everybody has the same training. And uh, we have them also do the, um, aside from doing our own, we've developed our own training in-house, but we also have them do their city training. And, you know, that takes several hours. And so if you tell an investigator, do your GCP training, and weeks are going by and they're not getting their training done, I mean, that's a very quick way to know that, okay, this is, this is, I'm going to have a hard time working with this investigator, you know, especially if they're going to be a PI for you. So I agree with Dr. Faki. I think first you need to try and tackle uh, your, your inner contacts. Um, but I have seen people find investigators through like um, advertisements on, on uh, newspaper ads or, or whatnot. Even so, Craigslist. Craigslist okay. works too. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So um, I know of sites that have found their PIs or expanded through advertising, you know, for the position. And even, even if it's just a sub I, let's say you get a very lucrative study, but it's a very specific patient population, and then you go find a specialist, and, you know, maybe they, they're they not ready to be a PI, but you tell them you right. be a sub I and refer right. patients, you'll get paid for your sub I activities. Right, um, right. It's the same concept. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah, um, there's a number of ways you can you can go about it. Now, okay, so we talk about biz dev budgets. Uh, we can spend an hour on each of these topics, but let's get into QA. And before I do that, Carrie, Carrie has been like a fan since I started, right? <laughs> she's she's with you guys. I've never met her. She's right. my regional project manager. She's 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 fabulous. Yeah. So what's that? What's regional project manager? So she oversees all the. Uh, she's regional director. So she oversees all the facilities. Um, essentially, some of the facilities are large enough where they have their own directors. Mm-hmm. Other sites, you know, we have sites in different stages. Sites are we have sites that are just opening up. Uh, there's mid-sized facilities, and then there's large uh, sites like this one, like Dr. Fakis. Oh, okay. Um, and so, essentially, she um, she oversees. You know, she helps me to oversee all the okay. facilities. So. Good, and we'll get into QA. But before we do that, um, you you guys are like a model because Miami, and I know you're in all over Florida. That is the most, by far, the most saturated site and the worst reputation. I mean, if I can just be frank, yeah, 
in research. Like yes. I've had CRAs tell me, please recommend sites everywhere except Florida. Yeah. Numerous times. Well, you know, initially when I opened up my site in Miami, I actually ended up having to change the name of the site um, because I found out that there were sponsors who didn't want to work with Miami sites. But news, good news, we're actually a preferred site for um, our sponsors. We've had fantastic um, audits. Um, we've actually had sponsors say, hey, you are our best site here in Miami. So wow. we've done, you know, you know, we've done really good, but, you know, again, you have to have that QA component. Um, all of the processes that we have built have been around um, what we know the FDA is looking for. Um, I've done consulting as well in FDA inspection, so I know what they're looking for. And so I think we've just gotten very efficient at, at uh, designing processes and we collaborate and things of that nature. So, um, and David is, a, David is a checklist uh, he's obsessed with, with checklists. So he makes a checklist for absolutely everything, even reporting an SAE, you know, he sounds he, like Chris. yes, he makes these trees. If this happens, <laughs> then you go to this. If this doesn't happen, then you go to that. So, um, I think he read the checklist manifesto. So he's, he's an absolute oh, fan. Oh, I've heard. I've been recommending Yeah. And that so, book. yeah. And so he's designed all kinds of forms as well. And I've actually said, David, I think it's time you consider maybe publishing you know, book or publishing some of these forms because I think sites could really benefit. Oh, yeah, from. he should, absolutely should. Center Watch yeah. is publishing things for $300 that provide almost no value. So, <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, so, yeah, so I've talked about that. But, yeah, so our sites have, you know, they have all these checklists from the minute a, a trial is awarded checklist, you know, startup checklist. Um, a patient's going to come in. We already have a checklist for everything that has to be done that day. So, I mean, you have to be very, very proactive with quality yeah, because yeah. Um, there's just a lot of room for error if you're not careful, you know. Yeah, and that whole Florida thing, really, it's to put to rest any excuses someone may have that's watching. Because we may have someone in L.A. watching or someone in Houston, which are also saturated markets, mm -hmm. and say, right. well, you know, I can never make it here because there's a site in and, uh, you know, they're from Florida. Like, you can't get a worse reputation than a research site in Florida, right? But they've proven, like, this is 15 years now, right? If not, yeah, long. yeah, yeah. No, and our sponsors are very, very happy with the work um, we've done. You know, they've actually um, come to us when they have very uh, important trials, and they, you know, they'll say, we just want the 10 best sites in the country. Um, you know, we need this data to be good. And so, you know, it, it's been an honor to be selected in Miami here in Dr. Fakimi. Dr. Fakimi has a stellar reputation. Are you um, in Miami right now? Are you guys in? No, I'm in the winter park. Uh, I'm in the winter oh, okay. park this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. This week I'm here. So. So QA, checklist, the checklist manifesto, someone recommended I read it. So I should talk to David about it. Yeah, yeah. But also, I think it's very important that you, we have dedicated um, people for quality control, quality assurance. Okay. Um, and so we do audits on a regular basis. Um, and it depends on, you know, what you have going on, how big the site is. Sometimes we do audits twice a month. Sometimes it's, you know, once a month. But I think it's really important that somebody's looking at that data because that is the thing that's going to get you more trials. You did a Absolutely. good job, they're going to come back to you. You did a poor job, they're not going to want to work with you. Uh, again, so, I mean, that's that's important. So we've designed right. our own way uh, processes in here. That so. is essential. I just came mm -hmm. from a uh, site audit, and you would be amazed at a brand new site High enrolled, they enrolled 60 patients in a study, never done research before, and sure enough, they have all tons of issues. Oh, uh, yeah, so they called on us to cl help clean up, and there's only so much you can do. But uh, you know how they have the red light, yellow light, green light for sites? This was red, and now we made them like orange. So they're, they're okay. <laughs> well, you know, when you look at when you look at 483s issued. Um, the longer a site has been in business, the better they perform. Yeah, go figure. So, you know, um, the newer sites have the greater issues. I mean, realistically, it takes a couple of years from what I've seen. It takes two to three years to get a site to stabilize. From the time you open up a site, it takes two to three years to really build a good team. You know, that those first couple of years, you may have some turnover. 
Uh, you may have ended up with the wrong person. I mean, it, it's not easy to be to build a successful facility. You no. have to be persistent. <laughs> you have to be on top of things. You have to have an involved investigator. Um, you know, I mean, really, <laughs> as you know. Go figure. Um, but you have to have someone that knows what they're doing and that is really on top, on one top thing, of things. One thing that is really helpful, if the site have an FDA audit right as they start, because that really puts you <laughs> in the right way. And I mean, the, right the thing is, no, yeah. nobody wants an FDA inspection, but I don't think there's any site out there that isn't better for an FDA inspection. You know, Un unless yeah. you've been shut down, then then you were doing some really bad stuff. Yeah. But, um, but it definitely <laughs> it definitely pushes you to be to be a better facility, and there are sponsors that won't touch. A site um, that that's you know received the 483, but the reality is is those sites are are going to have better quality than sites who've never had an FDA inspection. Of course, because they learn their mistakes. But oh, you yes. know, it's so important. People think it's so easy to start a research clinic. Like they watch a few videos on YouTube and then they call me, <laughs> and they're like, "Hey, you know, I wanted to get a, I want to start making money." A lot of them are from Miami. I want to start making <laughs> money. I got doctors. And I'm like, you realize it's March 2018. If you start today and get a study tomorrow, you're not making money this year. It's 2019 you're making money. Yeah. And they don't like that. They're like, well, what are you talking about? Right, 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 right. Yeah, and I mean, you get people, you know, you get coordinators that, you know, they think, gee, I can I can just go and open up a site. Because I, I get calls as well from coordinators wanting to open up a site. But there's a lot you know, just because you're a coordinator doesn't mean you're going to build a successful site because right. the business component is so important. And um, we, like I said, we're clinical people. We're not good on the business side. And even today, I can't tell you how many sites don't have any anyone looking at their AR. They have no systems in place wow. for track of their invoices. Um, it's just it's just really crazy. Do you guys use uh, CTMS for that? We do. We use um, well, we use real time, which we love. Um, mm. We use it at all of our facilities, but we also use QuickBooks. Um, yeah. and, and it's you know we love using both. So we have a really good grip on our AR. Are you doing that, or you have someone else doing that? We have somebody in house full time that that does it. So okay. all of our sites, we we keep that. Uh, very well controlled. Um, I can tell you that a site that doesn't have anyone doing their AR, you're probably leaving 10, 15, 20% of your gross on the table. Oh, yeah. I, know. I learned the hard way also <clears throat> when I started. I mean, later I'm like, oh my gosh, I left so much money back there. But you learn. You know, some people mm -hmm. pay to go to school for that, and others learn by losing the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> one way or yeah, another. It, absolutely. So, you know, you have to have someone that really knows, you know, what they're doing um, if you are going to build a, a successful facility. And I think, you know, we have a really good team here. You know, Dr. Fakhi, I mean, he's he's the clinical guru and he's he's a pro. And um, we've got great people, you know, that are experts in different areas. You know, I mean, I have expertise in the, the finance aspect of things. Um, we've got people that are experts in recruitment, uh, people experts in, you know, quality control, quality assurance. So you have to have, you know, and, and it takes the time. components. Yeah. And the thing is that with the smaller sites, they can't afford a lot of small sites may only have one or two people. Sometimes the owner is the coordinator, especially when you're starting, you know, the, the sometimes the ARMP is, you know, the sub I, the owner, the coordinator, you know what I mean? I see all kinds of different scenarios. But it's definitely worth your while um, to talk to someone that knows what they're doing. And that's something that we started doing as a network as well, um, helping sites get their AR, you know, implement good AR processes because what we still need for it. Yeah. What, what do you think about um, interns? So because another audience watching, we have a lot of site owners or people that mm -hmm. want to be sites. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have a lot of want to be CRAs and mm -hmm. CRCs, mm -hmm. and I always tell them, go intern, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have interns all the time, like, right next yes. to me right now is one, yes. and, we, you know, how do you guys feel about that, because, you know, sometimes 
they have to provide value, obviously, or else it's a waste of your time, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you react to interns? Like, what do you, do you guys accept them? We do accept interns. Uh, We accept interns in two areas, recruitment and also coordinating. Um, Because some some students, you know, want to get into uh, research. Recruitment, Doc. She said recruitment. Oh, yeah. Oh, He can't can't hear you, but uh, I tell all the interns the best way to get into any research clinic is to tell them you're a patient recruiter. And then go figure out how to do it. Go get somebody. Go, go bring them a patient the next day. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. For us. I'm, a, the, I'm absolutely right, he says. Yeah. <laughs> the game changer for us have been to develop really a good recruitment and a strong recruitment department. We mm-hmm. have five dedicated recruiters uh, working here. In this office. Yeah. In this office only. Because... I think a recruiter, a good recruiter, is worth the price, oh, the weight in gold. Their weight in gold, absolutely, really. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and the the interns, we do accept them here mm-hmm. because a lot of the people that we have hired have been interns that have, that have been rotated with us, mm-hmm. who that we have identified, which are very good, you know, that we have been able to given full-time jobs here. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, right now we have three or four that wow. is, okay. as an intern that actually are now working for us. Yeah, that they've uh, been hired by other sites in, in our network because as you know, Dan, finding good people, it, that's that's difficult in any field, in any. but I think in research, because we're so heavily regulated and there's so much room for error and we have to be so OCD about everything, it's even harder. And supply and demand. There's not yes. that many people to it's handle very, all these studies. Exactly. Very difficult to find a good good coordinator. So, um, I mean, as a matter of fact, Dr. Fakia and I have been thinking about, you know, gee, maybe we need to open up a school or something because, uh, I mean, you talk to other site directors and they're saying, gee, you know, we need good coordinators. We need we need good training programs. And um, we've done so well here with our, the quality of our work that, you know, that's something that we're can absolutely do. It. Yeah, we do the CRA Academy. And, I, mm-hmm. you know, we tell all of our students, if you join our academy, you're, you're guaranteed an internship if you pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. But for someone who may not be able to afford it, because uh, it's $3,000. So someone may not be able to afford it. I tell them. Go recruit patients at yeah. a site near you, and then they come back with all the excuses in the book. How do I find a site near you? Well, uh, Google <laughs> is one way, right? And then you go to those sites in person, by phone, by email, by letter, by smoke signal, however you want to get a hold of them. Snapchat. You want to talk to Anna? Go on Snapchat. Go on Well, Instagram. the thing is that very, very rarely is somebody going to turn down free work. Yeah. I mean, oh, I don't know. I don't now. know many people that are going to turn down, you know, somebody coming and saying, "Hey, could I? Can I no. do a free internship for you?" Absolutely. No. By no. as a fact, if anybody's out there listening, I'm looking for someone to help me with language negotiations. So, if you want to do an internship, learn contract language. Hit me contract up. Contract language, like budget. Yeah. Uh, yes, for clinical ah. trial agreements. So I'm actually you looking learn budget for budget or contract. In Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Too far. He's probably saying mm, no. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no. I'm, that's I'm, good. That's I'm good. looking for someone to work with me uh, long term to do contract and budget negotiations, but I'm looking for someone with um, some background in, in, in law, maybe somebody who just graduated uh, from college with oh, a yeah. degree in law or you know something we'll to that up, effect. We'll put up your LinkedIn. Because, I mean, profile. research is very, uh, research is a highly specialized field. It's not easy to get into, and not that many people uh, that know research law. Right, right. So, yeah. Uh, extreme, and changes all the time, and then tactics yes. used against you, like the Sunshine Act. It was yes. never meant to be for research, but they're using it because they can get away with it. It's not meant mm-hmm. to be for research. Well, they and they're using it as a tactic to try and keep your budget down. But the reality is, is the pharmaceutical companies are not reporting the entire. They're not reporting the line by line. They're not reporting how much they're paying you for an EKG. How much? You're, so that's that's just an excuse. Right. You know? They're right. just 
the total. So it's there's a sword no that cuts both ways, you know. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is no two sites are identical. You know, you may have a site that offers services that other sites don't offer, and so your overhead's going to be higher. You know, our coordinators have been with us um, on average nine years. Some of them have been with us 13 years or CCRCs. When you've had somebody for years, they're, they, you know, they're going to be higher priced coordinators than someone that you just hired um, off the street. So, I mean, there's different things that you can have. You might be offering services that, that, that other sites don't have. Having a recruiting department, you know, that increases your overhead. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. um, So we talked budgets, we talked biz dev, we talked uh, finding PIs, mm -hmm. um, wha what else, QA, mm -hmm. right? recruitment. So recruitment is another one that's always changing. I think the best way is to get more physicians interested in research with those patient mm -hmm. population and then train them on research. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to do that, even mm -hmm. though that's a lot of work, than it is to find uh, somebody who's well-versed in research that also has a very niche patient population. That's, that's right. like harder. Right. That's a needle on the haystack. So right. that, but, uh, what are some other things now? Because there's social media. I know you mm -hmm. guys do a lot of experimenting. What works well for you? I know every indication is different, but what, what has mm -hmm. been surprising you? as of late where you're like, wow, this works better than I thought it worked. What yeah. works what works well for us is to have a good pre screening uh, uh, process process that we do. For instance, we have we have a lot we do a lot of social media for asthma C O P D. So all those patients that come we see him on a per screening and if they need uh, something, they need some samples, we can give them. So we pretty much help them in the process. And if they are going to participate in one study, then we will build our database of that. So in a week here, we see 30 pre-screening for asthma, of which maybe two, three or four of those might be able to get into study. Okay. But we, we are continuously doing that. Um, but we get a lot of people from uh, social media. I mm -hmm. think that has been yeah. for us mm -hmm. quite Yeah, because we hired a social media company that's managing uh, that for us. And it's been wonderful. It's been absolutely fabulous. Really? Send, uh, me, oh, yeah. their, send me their info after the yeah. interview. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send you their info. They're absolutely wonderful. It's been a huge difference. But also how you tackle recruitment um, varies. For example, does your site, are you tied to private practice? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're tied to private practice, one of the things that your coordinator should be doing is looking at what patients that are coming in this week, what are they coming in for? That's an easy way, you know, you flag the chart and you say to the PI, hey, um, this patient seems to qualify for this trial. When you're talking to the patient, you flag the, the EMR chart. So there's different ways you can tackle it. If you're a standalone site, you don't have that. You have to rely more on referrals, advertising. So, you know, all of that changes. But um, definitely having a dedicated a dedicated recruiter or recruitment team is going to make all the difference in the world. Yeah. So, again, anyone watching as part of Guru Nation, I keep telling you, it's not just me. All right. Now we get two other people telling you patient <laughs> recruitment is the way to go. It's the oh, yes. best way to get into a site. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody does it because it's hard. Yep. Even after mm -hmm. I tell them, they're like, well, but then how do I get the patients? And it's like, well, that's kind of <laughs> what you have to do. Well, that, that's why exactly. Now, one thing that I wanted to clarify is, you know, we do these pre-screenings, but we actually have a, a, a generic IRB approved informed consent mm. that allows us to bring patients in. And so under that generic consent, we cover that, hey, we can do spirometry, we can do, you know, certain basic procedures, you know, like physical exam or, you know, you know so because we want to make sure that we are abiding, you know, by the, by the guidelines. Yeah, so. the whole, the IRB thing is a whole nother, I mean, I could spend another hour on that mm -hmm. uh, when it mm -hmm. comes to IRBs and social yeah. media. Yeah, um, yeah. Because they're in the business of making sure that they stay relevant. And, you mm -hmm. know, I argue that you don't need IRB approval when you're doing a generic 
advertisement about you building your brand that let's say right. you specialize in schizophrenia. Right. right? I mm-hmm. don't think you need IRB approval, but if you ask 10 IRBs, you're going to get 10 different variations of yes, you do. <laughs> Just to be on the safe side. <laughs> right, right, right. And right. let us send you right. what's the best email right. for your invoice right. to go to. Right. That's, right. uh, so, but study specific, absolutely. You need the IRB approval. Yep, absolutely. I, I think content marketing is going to be huge, like having um, podcasts like this. But imagine, let's say we had a asthma study and we just talk about asthma all the time, every day. Mm-hmm. I think you will get patients uh, that way, and I don't think you need IRB approval for those kind of things because there's mm-hmm. it's it's yeah, you're, not for you're the not gen- doing anything, right? Yeah, yeah, not for the generic stuff. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so you guys, yeah, I mean, oh, last thing is this is a long, thank you for your time, by the way. Um, this, we can go on forever, but uh, we'll do more. Um, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I know Dr. Fakie is, you know, he, we weren't intending, but I'm grateful that he, um, I never that he met. joined us. Yeah, I got and, you. and so I just want to say, so Dr. Fakie is the CEO and founder of Florida Pulmonary Research Institute and Florida Premier Research ah, Institute. Okay. So okay. Our, our, yeah. So. We've never met, uh, but I have seen you on Snapchat, I believe. <laughs> I think there was a birthday recently. Oh, was oh a, yes, because okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I yep. watch. Sometimes I watch. I watch yeah. Anna's. I watch yeah, Anna's. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> I watch Anna's stuff. I lately I haven't, but I've I've been. Well, I, I have. Do, I, watch I haven't Anna's. been posting much recently. So, which people are that. texting me, "Hey, are you okay? Are you sick? What's going on? Why are you not posting anything?" Yeah, I so. sent you a snap like a week ago, and I'm like, she still hasn't opened it. Uh, I wonder if everything's okay. <laughs> but yeah, now no, I got no. your number. I'm, so it's but, I'm, but I'm very grateful um, that you had us on. And, um, you know, anybody that has any questions, budgets, contracts, you know, I'm happy to help. Even if somebody's trying to start up a QA program, you know, we've got templates of everything and anything you can possibly imagine. And um, we're happy to share. And, I mean, last time we did these interviews, Dan, I got – so many emails from your followers and i did my best to send them you know templates and, and things like that you're so. gonna get way more because that was so long ago <laughs> um, and we still have people the other day somebody asked hey i want to you know where's this anna lady and mm-hmm. i was like uh that was like six years ago but they're still watching it and they're still asking yeah uh, and i to think we should, we should probably think about doing uh, another um podcast on you know how to negotiate yeah because that's really important well every it's not topic- just i can tell you go ask for startup saes amendments ind reports this that and the other but if you don't know how to ask for it you're not going to be successful in getting that um so. last thing conferences mm-hmm. uh i don't go to many mm-hmm. i not because i don't think they're good but i have a lot to do and i think my time is better spent <laughs> Doing those things. Very expensive. Very expensive. And uh, and I wonder why, right? But uh, so what do you think about conferences? Like I know there's, if you really wanted to, you can go to one every week. Mm, yeah, it all depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, from the BD perspective, you need to be in front of these sponsors constantly. You want to stay in their faces. So, you know, from that perspective, it's important. Um, if you have a, a new team member, new director, if you're trying to provide education, um, you know, I think it's important. For example, we're now uh, expanding into oncology trials. Mm-hmm. We've never, you know, oncology research for us is going to be new. It's so tough. we have to educate ourselves. So we were, you know, Dr. Fiki and I have been talking about who needs to now go to conferences to get trained on like billing compliance, mm-hmm. right? Because the billing mm-hmm. for oncology trials is very different. It's different, yeah. You're allowed to bill insurance, yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, the, com- I like that. Conferences, depending on, it's not the same conference every year. It's depending on what your needs are at that time. Right, depending on what your needs are. If you're a site, highly recommend um, go to the SCRS conference. Um, and now you're getting a lot of sponsors attending, a lot of CROs. So, it's, it's become a good conference for all kinds of stuff. Uh, ACRP has a lot of great um, educational stuff. Um, so, you know, they all serve a purpose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we're trying to make like the perfect conference, but it's going to take mm-hmm. a couple years to do it. So it's going to be a couple of uh, 
mediocre conferences before we get that perfect one. But mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do it, and it's not to make money. It's to right. get everyone together. People. Right. And Magi is also another wonderful conference. I'll be speaking there. Um, ah, and may yeah. uh, actually be doing um, a workshop on budgets and contracts. Are you budgets. going to Vegas? In Vegas? Or are you doing the East Coast? Uh, the, the East Coast. Okay. The Too bad you don't go to Vegas. Well, I may be going. I'm not sure because, uh, I mean, I spoke at the last one. I spoke at the uh, West Conference oh, okay. as well. So if they invite me, I will be there. The guru, you're invited to the Guru Conference whenever we do it next year. It's either going to be in California, Arizona, or Nevada. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Each state has its own challenges. California has the unions. You can't have somebody plugging in uh, an electrical cord in the outlet without being part of a union. So right. <laughs> we're not doing that. Well, one of the things that I recommend when you do your conference, I can't tell you how many experienced sites reach out to me and say, you know, Anna, we need to have a conference or a track for the experienced sites because there's a lot of information out there, but the, the, you know, different sites need to know different things. A site that is just starting out needs maybe basic information. A site that's been in business, like Dr. Fakis, for example, you know, the expertise is, is different. You know, you may be having, you know, although we all have different challenges, but you know what I mean? So um, I recommend right. maybe, maybe a track for the sites that have been up and running for a while. That, you experience know, maybe, sites. Yeah, yeah the, site that has, mm -hmm. the site that has no experience, they should, they, they should stay in their site and do work. Well, the, <laughs> Well, and they need to learn about everything. They need to learn about yeah. budgets and contracts. They need to learn about quality. They need to learn, I mean, they need to learn everything. You know, a site that's been in business for so many years, you know, you, you might be looking for different content. Mm -hmm. So, but I think budgets and contracts is, that's a, I think that's a topic that everyone uh, well, finds Well, you're there. You guys will get VIP uh, treatment to Thank you. wherever Thank you. we do it in one of those three states. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming on. I appreciate it. If someone wants to get all of you, I'm going to have links to your LinkedIn. Okay. Sure. But like, let's yeah. say, right. what other contact do you want to give them? Or is that good? Uh, you, you can also give them uh, my cell number, Dan. I don't mind. Um, but text me, please, because I get a lot really? of phone calls. And unless, <laughs> unless, yes, unless I recognize the number, wow. um, I, don't, I don't answer the You're calls. You're going to change your number by April. Yeah. So they can text me. They can text. I mean, it's on my website. It's everywhere. If you just Google my name, oh yeah, I, I give my cell phone out to everyone. So I'm, you know. The one I have, I feel less special now. Uh, let's see here. What's your cell number? You'll you'll feel you'll feel uh, more special when I give you my super private one. You have a suit, yo. That's I have a, how you I have a super it. private. <laughs> I have a super how, private line that, that very few people have. That's how As you that, know you made it. She's got. A generic number, but she has two cell phones, maybe more, but one for super private. So hopefully Dave, I have David, that one. David just recently got that number. He'd been, he was after me for that number. <laughs> <laughs> I just no. have Google Voice, and then I have my real <laughs> cell number, but it's the same phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I so what's it. your number? Where can people text so, you? So um, they can text me 352 266 352 Two six six two six two five. Again, you want to text me before you called me. So <laughs> they don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not going to get an answer then if ah, you just you if you just call me and don't text me first. You're not you're because if I don't recognize the number, I won't uh, I won't answer. So You've I but I will warned. return the voicemail. I will return. You've been warned, Guru Nation. Um, Thank you guys. I appreciate it. We'll we'll talk a little bit after off the air, but uh, we'll have you guys on again. This is great. Uh, we'll do it again. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. Stay tuned till next time. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Good night.